Mark Niles is director of the Houston Urban Debate League. This is from their website. The mission of the Houston Urban Debate League is to develop and support competitive debate in Houston area public schools. They found scholarships, competitive opportunities, and educational programs for high school and middle school students, and support debate through volunteerism and advocacy. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for having me. Um, this is really exciting. I love your video. So it's like seeing a mini celebrity on the screen in front of me. This is awesome. <laughs> a, a celebrity in a very, very tiny world. <laughs> this is actually, uh, it's the it's the second interview you've done, the second debate you've done though, at least though, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we had an interview like this um, quite recently. So um, it's exciting to have another one with you. So maybe you're the one becoming a celebrity. Uh, Two celebrities meeting each other. <laughs> uh, so the first thing I want to do is, as much as possible, get a picture of Houston and of the students that you serve through Huddle. So this is just some background on Houston from Wikipedia. So it's the, four, it's the fourth largest city in America after NYC, LA, and Chi-Town, 2.3 million people. In terms of race, uh, whites are a minority, which is... No surprise, as the area was ceded to the U.S. from Mexico after a uh, war. Uh, so 2010 statistics, 40 percent of Houston is, is Hispanic, 24 percent black, 22 percent white. Um, it's also religious. 73 percent of Houston's are Houstonians are Christian. And um, despite some strong industries, it's fairly poor. So medium income is roughly half a little bit more than half of national average. And here's a quote I found that Houston claims the largest number of newly poor neighborhoods in the country after Detroit, with about half a million people below the poverty line. So in terms of Houston, the city, uh, what am I missing? And could you first characterize the students that Huddle serves uh, as well as you can? Sure. Um, so one of my favorite little trivia things about Houston is a few years ago, it was announced as the most diverse city in the United States, beating out New York. So one of the cool things about living here is you like the world is kind of your oyster. There's so many amazing restaurants from all different cultures. It's like you can eat one type of food one day, another type of food the next day. So it's very much a melting pot and you get to see people from all walks of life, which is um, one of the coolest things about Houston. I would say that our students kind of mirror that. We definitely work a lot with um, the inner city schools. We're called the Houston Urban Debate League because we're trying to reach those schools that may not have the funds or resources to participate in debate. So lots of the students we serve um, are maybe students that are going to college for the first time out of their family. They're students that go to schools that maybe are under-resourced and we're just trying to give those resources to them and help them use debate in order to lift themselves up and make changes in the world and advocate in their community. Mm. This is um, honestly, like I, I, I got this email from you and then I st started doing a little bit of research actually. And I saw some TikTok that mentioned this, uh, this uh, or urban debate leagues. And honestly, I didn't know that there's this whole world of urban debate leagues out, out there. Obviously I'm separated a little bit from uh, the U.S. debate scene being in Asia. Um, do you work with other urban debate leagues or ha have you communicated at all with them? Um, yeah, there is a organization called the National Association for Urban Debate League. We just call them NODL for short, but they're based in Chicago. So I believe the first urban debate league was actually established in Chicago. And throughout time, there's been many urban debate leagues that have popped up throughout the U.S. I, I don't know the number of them off the top of my head, but it's somewhere between 20 and 30. So we have informal relationships with all the other urban debate leagues. We have um, like an email group that if any of us are having issues or wanting to bounce ideas off of other people doing similar work, we have that pathway. But the area each year that we come together is the Noddle National Championship. So each urban debate league basically gets to send their top two teams in policy debate to a national tournament. Usually it's in some place like Chicago where Noddle is based or it's been in Washington, D.C. a lot. 
and all the Urban Debate League students from across the nation to come together. And there's this glorious tournament where, yes, it's about competition, but really it's the celebration of urban debate. And that's kind of our main meeting point throughout the year. Now this last year, the tournament was obviously virtual, but next year it's scheduled to be in person again in Dallas. And it's just a great network of people that really care about the same mission. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll talk about this, uh, I think, a little bit more later. Um, I want to go back to the students very briefly. There's something that it was either you or your um, coworker had mentioned in the other podcast that I listened to, where you said that um, students face a lot of challenges and obstacles. Um, some of the students you serve, presumably not all. And I would also note that you said Houston is a very diverse place. We didn't really touch on um or I didn't touch on, Wikipedia didn't touch on, uh, the, the immigrant population, right? Maybe first or second generation immigrants, which obviously could add to the diversity. But in any case, as far as these challenges and obstacles, what are some of these challenges and obstacles that uh, students face, maybe especially in, in terms of how it affects their uh, education? Yeah, um, I would say that Houston being a large um, urban city, you it can it's just very under-resourced for public education. And lots of the, the money that goes to education is ending up in charter schools and suburban schools. So the largest problem we have all stems to the funding of the schools, um, paying the teachers in those schools enough to attract the talent. So the largest obstacle is that um, we just need more resources in our school. And there's oftentimes not a lot of funding for after school activities like debate, but not just debate. Many other after school activities are kind of not a priority. So other organizations just like Huddle trying to bring things um, to the table is very, very needed in Houston for sure. Mm, needed, but um, hard to deliver. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, also, we also have a lot of um, English second language populations here. So we have to offer the lots of, keep that in mind when we're, when we're doing things. So it's just a big city and has all the problems that a big city has. Um, a lot of people with not enough money around to resource everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so I, I suppose Huddle works mostly through um, uh, donations, or at least this is pa uh, part of how the, the organization works. Yeah, so Huddle, Huddle gets the, their funding for their program in a few different ways. Lots of the school districts actually buy in by providing resources from the school district um, funds available to, to support these things. So that's part of it. Part of it is Huddle getting donations from donors. Lots of the donors that Huddle br brings in are current successful professionals who credit debate as being like a defining moment in their life. There's so mm. many former debaters who are who have got so much from the activity. It's and Texas is such a huge debate state. You can basically find debaters. You throw a rock in downtown and you hit five debaters before the rock hits <laughs> the ground. So we get lots of donations from um, former debaters who are now lawyers, CEOs, and things like that. Plus the school district contributions, and that's pretty much how the program is funded. Mm. And uh, looking at Huddle's website, especially the uh, board of directors and just the, the the history, it's a very impressive organization. Uh, uh, Ten plus years, I believe it's been active. Uh, what are the numbers? 40,000. Let me find this actually number. No. Uh, yeah. Ten -ish years act oh, active in 40,000 high schools, dozens of middle schools now. Uh, the board of directors has quite a number of lawyers, a couple of judges on it. Um, so it's, it's, it's obviously shows that there's a ton of people who believe in the mission of, of debate, but uh, Huddle as well, specifically. Yeah, um, debate was huge in Houston uh, many years ago. Most public schools had very thriving debate programs. The University of Houston had a very thriving debate program. Our current mayor, Sylvester Turner, was a debater at the University of Houston in its college days. And so all these very influential people that went through debate in their high school years basically um, started looking around and surveying the landscape of debate in Houston. And in 2007, 2008, it just came apparent to them that debate, at least in the inner city schools, pretty much disappeared from the Houston landscape. So Huddle was kind of created during that time period to bring debate back. It was in a handful of schools. 
but now, like you said, it's in quite a lot of schools in our area. Um, at least, um, I don't know about 40,000, but, but. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> the number 40 was coming into my head, 40 schools, 40 high schools, dozen middle schools. I know there's yeah. a number of the, the number of students who served was also impressive, but I don't, I don't have that. Oh number. yeah, a lot. Yeah, so most of the people on our board come from um, those golden years of debate when it was really big in Houston and uh, they really wanted to see it come back. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's obviously a lot of people, I mean, I presumably, you know, you're, you're, yourself included in, in your role who, um, who really believe that debate maybe uniquely can uh, uh, help students academically, right? Or, or, or change students per, perhaps for the better. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, so debate, and I really, what's really interesting about debate is when you think about who would make a great debater, the, fir the first thought that comes to mind for a lot of people is that extroverted student that's always raising their hand, that's um, al already kind of someone that's active in class. And yes, it, debate is good for those type of students, but the students that actually you might think, you may not think of in the first place, that student that may be kind of in the back of the classroom, they're a very, they're very internal with their thoughts. Debate will oftentimes help those students that really need to break out of their shell and have a place to put all that energy more than those students you would traditionally think would benefit from it. So lots of the problems we have with academics, be it um, learning the English language, getting better at reading proficiency, all those things, there's not a better activity than debate to like increase the rigor of um, that information. And something I should, should have showed you is a recent study just came out came out about a week ago, um, NODL, the National Association, worked with a, um, a researcher and they looked at Huddle's data from 2012 to 2015. And it was astounding results, like major GPA improvements from the Huddle debaters. And this also checked for selection bias. It helped with college readiness benchmarks, math, STEM things. So debate really helps academic benchmarks all across the board. It's, it's, there's not really anything like it for that. I'm going to uh, email later, ask you for that study. It was actually one of the things I wanted to talk about because it is it is a, a, a frustration I have for myself. So so I've worked mostly in the in the in, well, I, I work for a private debate school. Right. And the 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 students we serve are, I would say, polar opposite. They're they're extremely privileged students who have tons of resources, tons of money. Um, and and I think debate is. I, I don't know how accurate this characterization is, but it, but it but it it's uh, traditionally viewed, I think, by a lot of people as sort of an elite activity, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if right. if if you say you play rugby or or polo or something, you're going to think the same thing, right? And so this this issue of selection bias obviously comes up. Okay, debaters do well, right? But <laughs> is it because they're they're from educated households, right? Uh, uh, typically, right. and 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 perhaps urban debate leagues uh, would be the place to. Um, to kind of compare that, right? Um, but there, there, it's still not really um, some scientific evidence just because everyone believes it. And intuitively it makes sense, right? Like debate mm. uh, focuses on, on speaking skills, on research, on, on, on reading, a, 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 on critical thinking. And, and these are sort of cross applicable uh, skills that you need to succeed in academics, right? So it's not a surprise and it makes sense, but still we don't really have a whole lot of proof or evidence scientifically, which maybe I'm a I'm I'm a stickler for, but it's like it's like I, I hope that if we're pouring all of this this effort and resources into trying to help students, that it, it's truly targeted as well as possible, right? I mean, certainly you can imagine, um, you know, a, a a chess club or or an art club or a dancing club after school, where maybe it could increase kids' performance, maybe their social cohesion or something. But like, mm -hmm. is this really the best? The best thing to do. So to have that, um, uh, some some studies, uh, which I haven't been able to find a whole lot of, obviously, does does make me feel uh, better about it. Yeah, if it, a good place to look for those studies later is if you go to Noddle's website. I believe they have an area that includes a link to the most current study that was Houston specific. But there was also some foundational studies into urban debate leagues that happened many years ago focused on the Chicago League. And so this has been, there's been studies over time that have proven each time the impacts that debate has and, and there are ama it's amazing impacts. 
Well, one of the issues is that, you know, people really care about things um, that look really flashy on the outside. People love sports, people love football. So there's, there's lots of studies into those type of activi activities, but um, debate just doesn't have that flair on the outside. If, if you're not someone who um, knows what debate is, it's not, it doesn't light that fire under you. Like if people hear about sports, like they're like, oh yeah, I know what sports is. It, debate just doesn't get as much as attention as some of those other activities where it really, really should. I think it's a marketing issue. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it, it, it could be flashy, actually. Right. I mean, if if there I mean, there are there are certainly moments during debate rounds that are uh, full of fireworks. Right. Right. Uh, I, I, I had a, a friend recently come to one of our, our local tournaments. He's a videographer and, and he made sort of a promo vid, which is just super impressive. Some 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 interviews with students and some uh, prep during rounds and some even footage of the rounds themselves. And uh, I, I think it's something I'd, I'd like to do. I'll be back to the States in August. And I think I would like to uh, see if I can get some videographers into tournaments to make some sort of promo vids. I, I, I kind of imagine like maybe this is kind of a fantasy, but who knows, it could happen uh, that there will be like a Netflix series or something about, you know, about uh, debate at some point. Yeah, <laughs> I've always thought a similar thing. Like my idea is a documentary that follows like multiple teams from a beginning of a debate season to the end. And what's great is there's competition there. So if you're like following teams, you can have their individual stories and see their growth over a year. But then sometimes you'll actually see two teams go against each other in a round. And I think it would make an amazing documentary and you could really like see the impact of debate in a really cool Netflix or HBO documentary. We just got to get someone to do that. Yes, yes, we got to get mm -hmm. someone, and and I mean, it could it could be debate has its uh, moment to shine, sort of yet to come. I mean, not that it hasn't had its moments in the past, but um, uh, as you say, it's not as uh, it's not quite as popular as basketball or something, right. something something like that. Um, I'd like to ask, um, because this is something I, I was really wondering about, um. What, what is it exactly that Huddle does in Houston or, or what is it that, that you do? You guys, because because if you're, if you, I, I imagine initially that you were maybe like a debate coach giving lectures in classrooms, but there's no way you're doing that in 60 schools. No. Um, and, and my path, this, this, let me sit in a different chair. This chair is so squeaky. Sure. You're Switch it up. All these um, squeaks real quick. But, uh, my path to Huddle, I, I actually don't have a debate background at all. I was kind of a band nerd and started working for the nonprofit side fundraising many years ago. And when an opportunity kind of rose itself for me to move into the programming side, I took it. But what Huddle does is um, teaching debate requires a lot of resources. You need someone that has the content knowledge. You need the budget to put on tournaments get transportation to tournaments, pay for food. So what Huddle does is they remove all those barriers for the schools. One, we put on tournaments for the schools at no charge. So all of our mm -hmm. member schools become, um, they get, we arrange transportation for them. We provide their food. We pay for all the judges. We bring in all the judges. We run the tournament. So wow. we make it very, very easy. No barrier to entry for our schools to get in, in terms of getting into the tournaments. We also provide support. We have a lot of schools, so we're not like at every school every single day, but we do go directly into classrooms and work with the students and the teachers to make sure they're like getting the support they need to learn debate. We, you know, get them into tournaments outside of Huddle. We help get them into national tournaments. So we're basically a support there for them. We can advocate to principals to give a teacher a class who is only doing it after school. So. Our core job is just removing those barriers and getting kids into tournaments. So then a lot of the clubs will have a, a teacher or some of them are self-directed or it just kind of depends on the organization of the school, I guess. Yeah, there, there's not really a one size fits all approach. And another resource we provide that I forgot to mention is we actually stipend our teachers. So as an incentive for a teacher to take on this extra role of being a debate coach and spending all the weekends at tournaments, they also get stipends. So we give them that incentive if, and it's not just an extra thing that's thrown on top of a teacher's already um, crazy workload. They, they get a little bit of compensation for that. 
So in terms of looking at all the different schools, we'll have some schools that are very lucky where the principal supports debate and they give the teacher a debate class or multiple debate classes. And those schools tend to do very well because they have that dedicated time during the day to focus on debate and it's there, those, those schools progress very well. Then we'll have other schools who there's not room for debate in the schedule and the teacher will simply do it after school or during lunch or something. And those schools can have a lot of success too. Um, our, our goal is to get principals to see the value of debate and not only let our program be in the school, but also give those teachers classes because it makes it so much easier for the schools when they have a real debate class at their school. That makes sense. That makes sense. I see. Um, in, so, so I guess with, with your job, you're not, mostly you're not working directly with students. There's a lot of like high level organization uh, uh, that you do a lot of like uh, networking, like you say, convincing principals to sign on board, things like this. Yeah, um, I guess I'll look at before the pandemic, what, what a typical week was like, because this last year Please. and a half was totally crazy. But before right. a pandemic, <laughs> Yeah, a typical week, I'd probably go to five schools, maybe a week. I'd go to five debate classes a week and work with kids. So that that would be part of my week. Uh, a, another part of my week would be making sure the buses for the upcoming tournament are, are arranged and everything's working well. Another part would be like getting judges. I would typically have to get between 50 and 80 judges for a tournament. So I have a very large judge pool. Um, it, it's That's a lot. It's one of my favorite parts of my job. I love getting judges and it's, it's just so fun to build that network of people that care about debate so much and, and bringing them in. So the logistics of a debate tournament and then supporting schools, um, it's a full-time job. There, there's two of us that, um, that do this and really three across Houston that do this work and we're busy. We're, we're, we're always have something to do. I never would have uh, thought I could hear that sentence. My favorite part of my job was getting 50 to 100 <laughs> debate judges for a tournament. <laughs> I don't know why I like it. I think at this point, I have, I've ran over 120 or 130 tournaments in the last um, nine years. Oh my gosh. And yeah, I, I, just, I just really like logi the logistic side of getting judges. I, I like finding the people that are really going to write good ballots and really help our kids improve. It, it's just fun. Huh, huh. Uh, what what so so do you uh, sometimes have uh, complaints or or recommendations about judges that there's some judges you really really want to be at the tournament and some sort of last minute ones because of uh, what perhaps their their dedication to the activity or something? Yeah, I mean we we have judge complaint forms at our out at our tournaments. So what I tell our coaches is that our tournaments are large. I have to get between 50 or 80 people here. We're going to do our best to get the best judges we can find. But sometimes, like in any workplace, you're going to get someone who maybe isn't the greatest. So I, I want to know when a judge needs some improvement so we can kind of talk to them and try to make them a better judge or decide if it's someone we even want to use again in the future. But um, for the most part, I also try to tell our coaches, one of the common complaints is our coaches want very experienced judges that know debate and know all the technical aspects and the vernacular. And for me, I like a diverse judge pool. I do want those type of um, individuals in the pool, but I don't want that to be the majority. I also want a lot of parent type judges in there that maybe have only judged one or two debate rounds and have no walk into a PF round for the first time and have never done it before. I think judge adaptation and having to adapt to that lay judge one round and then having that like debate expert who's been in the field for 15 years come in the next round and adapt a different way. So I try to explain to our both the students and coaches that, you know, you're always going to have a bad judge or a judge you a judge you're not happy with, but that's just kind of how the cookie crumbles sometimes. Yeah, that is that is definitely life. And it, it is it is a, a kind of a, a frustrating activity, I think, for students in that way, because there's there's sort of in a way there's very few um, like competitive activities you can compete in in grade school that's so subjective, right? Like Maybe right perhaps perhaps most sports you know i don't know maybe like gymnastics or something aside you don't really have like a subjective call of like okay who did this well who did that well but especially when you have this diverse 
judge pool, you're going to have that like uh, that issue much more. Mm -hmm. uh, in very interesting. Um, one of my biggest complaints when I think about debate as a sport is that it's um, it's not practical. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 um, I don't know if this is really a, 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 a fair complaint, but it is something I think about a lot that it's, you maybe focus on like discussion and policy action, but I think about this, for example, like if you, if you were to study, um, pollution, right. And you, right. you have maybe a policy topic for a year and you, uh, you know, do really deep research on like five different plans and spend thousands of hours of researching pollution, you would have really done less good for the world than if you like go outside and pick up trash for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, do you at all fair share the same intuition about debate in terms of its potential? Or do you think I'm off track here? I don't know. I, I kind of think that mo lots of the students that I see go to the program are very, um, civically minded and they want to make a difference in the world. And so debate is giving these, these young people the skills to actually like advocate for what they think is the, the preferable future. And they're going to be making changes when they're old enough to get into um, government or when, the, or if they're just activists in their own community. So although they may not be like making direct impacts during that debate season, picking up trash or volunteering or things of those nature, they're going to make the huge differences when they get in the working world. Um, one of the things I always tell people is you, you hear folks always talk about the younger generation and, oh man, this world's going to go to hell uh, when this younger generation is in charge. I have the very, very opposite reaction. Like go into one of these debate rounds, you'll be amazed at what these young people are talking about and what they can understand. I think we're in the best hands we could be in seeing what these young, young people are discussing and capable of. Yeah, I I, sh I share exactly the same intuition. Absolutely, I would say um, uh, it. I, I, it's hard to nail down a percentage, but many many of my students are much smarter than me. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're 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 younger than me, right? Maybe I have something to teach them, but they're they're much smarter than me. And and a lot of them are. It's, it's more than that. It's it's that that they're like more. A lot of them are they're like really morally good people. You know, like there mm -hmm. there is also yeah this thought that like the entire generation is being fed memes from TikTok, and this is how our our uh, our future will, will be governed. But a lot of them are like really like very decent people as well. Uh -huh. Um. <clears throat> If you could, so this is my big complaint about debate. If, if there's anything that you could change about debate or how it might be approached through huddle, what, what might it be? Is there, is there anything that you can think about sort of the, the future potential of debate that, that you might want to change or directions you might want to see it uh, go in? I just think it should be a prioritized activity at the higher levels of school administration. I wish we didn't have to go into a principal's office and explain the benefits of debate every time and like have to sell really hard to get a program. I wish I could take for granted that everyone thought debate was important and that everyone wanted to jump into this free program that gives, you know, students and teachers this great, great thing. I just want debate in the future to be more recognized for, you know, the benefits it has, just like sports is recognized for the benefits it has. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, good feedback. I, I, I feel uh, that there's a lot of that, that maybe the, the hierarchy of classes we have at school, and I think a lot of people feel this way, is maybe not, um, not as it should be. Like, um, uh, I think, I think kind of the most unassailable subject might be math, right? But I, I really have this strong intuition that like math is really not necessary for many kids. There's many kids that are really bad at math, who hate it, that go to math class all the time that don't do well or are wasting their time or are being frustrated and stressed out, right? And it could be that there's some kids who maybe shouldn't be learning advanced math. Yeah. I mean, Excel does all that for you. So for most yeah. people, Excel does everything and you might be better suited to work on your reasoning skills over your, you know, math skills. Yeah. And I, I don't think the same thing applies to debate. It, it's not that everyone will be good at debate, but it, it does seem like something just because it covers so many key, like crucial academic areas, that's some, something that almost everyone could benefit from, at least. Yeah. Um, one of the problems we have in Texas 
is there used to be a class called communication applications that was required statewide. Basically, you had to get a speech credit statewide and communication applications would work for that credit. So that was um, basically made not a requirement five or six years ago. So the communication applications class, it brought in all these teachers who were public speaking experts and they just tended to also do debate. So they would teach the communication applications class but also have a few sections of debate. And debate was thriving during that time. But as soon as that class was not made a requirement anymore, each year you see less and less of the public speaking debate experts in the school and debate is just not as much of a priority now. So that's, that's a Texas problem. I don't know how it is um, in the rest of, in other states about that, but that's one of our major issues here. You, you said that uh, debate did kind of have a, a, a sort of its time to shine, a golden age in Texas. Is that kind of a, a big part of what uh, made it fall away? Is that that curriculum requirement? I think it was falling away a little bit before that as well, but that kind of, to me, was kind of a nail in the coffin type of thing, you know? Yeah, 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 it makes sense. All right, that's all the questions I have for you. Awesome. Um, for anyone in the Houston area, for parents, for teachers, for potential volunteers, potential judges, uh, how can they get in touch with you? So probably the best way would be to Google Houston Urban Debate League, and I believe it's HoustonUrbanDebateLeague.org is the website. They should have um, a volunteer area on that website, and if you sign up there, that information will trickle its way down to get into our judge pool. And if you are in Houston and hearing this, there's not a better way to spend your weekends than judging debate. Uh, you're giving back and seeing... Um, these amazing students in action. So I'd really encourage you to come and uh, give some time to judging debate. Great, thank you, Mark. Awesome, thank you, Joel. All right, that's it for the interview. Awesome. Um, we could uh, uh, talk just a little bit about this, uh, this course that we mentioned in the email. Um, it's something that's under development only for a public forum um, at this point, but um, I can also, uh, show it to you if you'd like. I can add your email in so you can just kind of browse what it is exactly. There's perhaps some units that could be applicable if you're doing world skills or something. There's there's some things about case making and weighing and research and things like that. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, we uh, So we do five different formats in Huddle and PF is one of them. And PF at our camp that's coming up uh, on July 12th is the first day of our virtual camp. Usually it's in person. Our PF lab is actually really small this year, which is kind of, um, I wish it was bigger, but we had to put a lot of new debaters into the PF lab. So there's gonna be like a few experienced debaters in that lab and then a few like, I don't know what debate is. So it would be, if, if this resource is available like before July 12th, it could be something great for me to get these newbies up to speed before the first day they're in PF lab, you know? But if not, we have other ways to. Mm, mm. Yeah, uh, you're, you're, I, I, would, I would say you, can, you should take a look at it first and then see if, if it can be used, right? Uh, because okay. um, it is, I would say, very much in, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's up, it's live, it's ready to use, but it's still kind of being tested, right? Uh, okay. So uh, I don't know if, if it could potentially be a little bit too high level. I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, but that's what I, I would love for people to check it out at least and, and see what they think so we can get it to a place where it's really useful for, yeah, for, for new debaters to actually like learn. Um, you guys do P PF, you also do world schools, yes? We do. And, and what are the other three styles? Policy, so I guess? We do world schools, we do cross-examination, we do PF, we do Lincoln-Douglas, then we do congressional debate as well. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, a lot of debate styles. I almost wish we wouldn't have added so many because it made them um, lots of our schools have started specializing in a format. So we'll like have PF only has two schools in it sometimes. And it's like very, I wish we had less formats. So there was a more varied pool sometimes. Yeah, that is a tough thing. What, what ones would you ax off the list? Um, CX, I would not ax off just because it was what urban debate leagues were founded on. 
world schools was kind of huddle thing that really put us on the map. We were one of the, the first people to do it in the United States in a big way. So world schools, I don't see something I'd ever consider. So it would be LDPF or Congress would be the only ones I'd have to uh, consider. I think I, I, I think I totally agree. I think uh, CX obviously is kind of like the, the pinnacle of the art form. And then uh, world schools. I think, like you, you're you're saying, some student or some schools specialize, but also some um, schools might specialize in PF. I think world schools is awesome because it is like global. You know, it is it's very international. Favorite. So, yeah, and and kind of the the emphasis on being a, a a bit more impromptu. I think also can can make it accessible in terms of like prep work. You know, you can't research the prep topic for a month or something. Yeah. Um... I love world schools and we, one of the huddle teams just won the national championship a week ago, the NSCA. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah. It's, um, it was actually one of, uh, so like I said earlier, I work for HISD, but huddle serves a, a bunch of other school districts. And one of those other school districts through huddle won first place. And it was just amazing. Wow. Really? Yeah, congratulations. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. It, uh, I didn't do much of the coaching there cause it wasn't my school district, but it, I was just blown away seeing that. Yeah, that is that is super super cool. Uh, all right, anything you got for me? Um, all I would say is that I got a lot of inspiration from some of your videos, especially the ones where we're using the Prezi functionality to um, like kind of have the presentation coming in around you. And I'd be curious, like, if, if you ever get to the point to where you're, like, operating, like, selling files and things of that sort, like Champion Briefs or, like, who, all the other companies who do that type of stuff, please, please let us know. Um, we haven't been allowed to, like, buy that often, but every once in a while we are. And I've really liked what you put out, and our kids have said a lot of great things about it. So any opportunity like to like get more of your content to our kids, I'd, I'd love to take advantage of. Mm. You know, we, do, we do, yeah. I, I do, I do put together briefs for our, um, for PF topics. You've seen those? Yeah. And uh, every time I see your stuff, I'm like, ah, oh, he can't keep doing this for free for long. So I'm like, this isn't a, renewable, <laughs> it's not a renewable resource. So I'm like, you know what I mean? I know, I know what you mean. The thing is, I have a, I do have a job. I teach debate, and uh, so it's, uh, yeah, you're right. I wouldn't keep doing it for free forever, but I that wouldn't put that onus on your shoulders. This is definitely my baby to to grow up as it needs to, and I, I think the uh, my priority would be to be getting it to more students more than making uh, more money. But still, it's a good offer, and I, I appreciate you say that. Yeah, and if you're ever like. Um like ever interested in teaching at one of our camps or something like uh, usually we do our camps in person, but um, we'll, this will be our second year virtual. We'll probably be back in person next year. Again, if you're like interested in coming down and available to come down to Houston during July. And uh, that would be something I would love to talk about in the future. All right, cool. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate both of those offers. That's, that's, that's quite generous. Uh, can, can I ask what, what is keeping you from uh, going in person now? Is it, uh, um, just sc school no it's it's basically uh we didn't handle covid very well down here in in the states and um so let, let me see we didn't do any of our tournaments in person we did them all virtual and then when we were given the um myself john who you seen me reference on emails and one of my colleagues um, that works at a bunch of other school districts we just came to a consensus when we decided to go virtual. We did it back in February. In February, we didn't know how things would look like in July. So we just decided to take what we thought was the safer option. Our camp is also an overnight camp. And there would mm. have been all these considerations about how COVID protocols would be used when you have kids in dorms together and all that stuff. So we just did it out of an abundance of caution and we actually don't know what we're going to do for tournaments next year. Um, I think we're starting to feel pressure to go back in person from the powers that be above us. So we, mm. we may not have a, a choice in the matter, but I think our goal for our tournaments next year is to start off virtual, maybe with the first one and gradually get back in person. 
I think a lot of our kids who haven't been around large groups of people or other kids for a year and a half, there's going to be a lot of social and emotional issues there. And I don't know if growing three, 400 kids in a cafeteria together is the best thing without mm. like gradually getting there. So <laughs> if we thought this year was crazy, I think next year is going to be the even crazier as we try to return to something more normal, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think there's definitely good and bad things about the virtual tournament. So, yeah, I loved some That's parts of them and I hated some parts of them. Um, very much less complaints that virtual. That's the one thing I did like is uh, I didn't have to deal with people screaming down, screaming my head off all the time about judge decisions <laughs> as much, which was nice. But I missed seeing the kids um, face to face and being able to troubleshoot issues in the school, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, all right. Uh, could you, uh, uh, I'll send you an email if you forget, but could you send me that study that you mentioned? Yeah. Um, do you want me to try to pop it in the chat real quick? Sure. Yeah. If it's, if it's give handy. Me, give me one second. I know it's on sure, an auto sure. website in a handy place. Sure. Yeah. The study was pretty, oh, it's right there on their homepage. Um, I, I've tried to verify what a lot of other private companies have said about benefits of debate. And there's just so much nonsense out there when you're trying to market things that I'm, maybe I'm just skeptical that there's actual research out there. Yeah. The, um, I'm going to maybe pronounce her name wrong. I think it's Mazook, but the researcher is Dr. Mazook. And she did the original study with the Chicago League 10 or so years ago. So this is kind of a continuation of her research with Chicago. If you had more questions, I'm sure you could just look her up by Googling her name and finding her contact information. She'd probably be interested. She might, if you continue this podcast thing, she might be a great guest to bring on. Yeah, you're right. You're right. This would be really good. Yeah, they're from Michigan too. It's where I'm from. Oh, awesome. That's really cool. There's this looks really legit. This looks it, probably the, the most legit uh, analysis I've seen of, of debate. All the well, other things I've seen have been <laughs> absolute nonsense. Yeah, I mean, me and my colleague basically from 2012 to 2015, we kept track of every single debater who went through the program, uh, all their socioeconomic information, exactly what event they did at every tournament. And then we sent that to HISD's research department, and they basically gave this researcher our data plus a sample of HISD data, similar students. And so they used those two different data sets to do this study. I think it's pretty good. This is like gold to me. This is really, really <laughs> cool. This is the next the next two hours of my life. <laughs> I'm going awesome. to be reading this. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I'm really happy to meet you. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch. Yeah, thanks. Um, have a good rest of your day. I'm about to go to bed in a few hours, but you enjoy this early wake up time. <laughs> we'll do, we'll do. All right. Bye. -bye. bye.